how what how would you approach the same uh, trying to achieve the same outcomes in in a state that has existing silos existing um, uh, infrastructure and and set up there what would the what would the differences in approach be if any yeah uh, though technically Andhra Pradesh is a new state but uh, it is a you know a state which was in existence and it was part of the com composite state so it's not as if we are starting with a clean slate here in Andhra Pradesh out of the 72 just to give a idea of the magnitude of, uh, you know, what is new and what is old. Out of 72, the portfolio of 72 applications which I showed and others also talked about it, 27 of them are already existing legacy systems, which is, we call it as brownfield and remaining 45 are greenfield applications like the CLGS we have seen or the data analytics that Srinivas uh, spoke about. So. It is uh, roughly, you know, 27.45 is the ratio of... Uh, so you need to customize the enterprise architecture in such a manner that, you know, you are getting into a running train or a moving train at this point of time as far as e pragati is concerned. That's how you need to... You can't brush aside the existing uh, systems overnight and then go for a new one. So that is a constraint, that is also a plus, that is also you can build upon what is existing is a plus point so that you can show quicker results, the positive side. On the other side, you know, you have to live with certain compromises in terms of the overall architecture. That's how I would see that. Anyone, any, anything to add on that? Thanks. Uh, so this is one of the questions with, that I typically get asked when I, you know, present to other states because they keep saying, oh, AP is a new state, they are doing everything greenfield. That's not true, right? As he said, the services are existing. Yes, some of the systems are new, the, the policies are there, the practices are there, the legacy and the heritage, whatever you might call, are there. So it's not as if it's a new, new state in that sense. It's, it's not a new country, you know, that the constitution has to be defined and all that. So. Uh, yeah, so I really don't buy that as an excuse for by any state for not doing enterprise architecture, saying that AP is a unique situation and, you know, it's a new state, that's why they could do it. Uh, other states can also try. I think it's the lack of conviction rather than anything, just looking for, you know, uh, reasons not to do it. Right. Yeah. right. Okay. So, we've got... Uh Yes, multiple hours worth of questions if we allowed them to be that way, but we are standing between people and lunch. So um, let me start with this one. Um, how are requirements being maintained and classified? Are there any specific tools and strategies used for requirements management? So the high level requirements uh, are being captured in what, uh, you know, Gopal was saying, the EPRS, right? So those are the basic, uh, I would say, broad high level requirements because the whole idea here is that once the uh, EPRS is made available. EPRS is e Pragati e Pragati requirement requirement specification. You have SRS, you have FRS. Yeah. We have something in between these two <laughs> which is called the EPRS. Yeah. yeah. So it's a publicly available document. It's going to be, I think one of them have already been released. So the idea is we have a broad high level requirements there. Uh, and then all of the respondents who are going to be, you know, uh, let's say bidding for those projects, so to speak, will have to detail out the requirements. So that is the uh, approach because remember that uh, we are doing the architecture, we are not doing the low level design. So please understand that. So don't start the SDLC here. The SDLC will kick in later on, right? So that's, that's important. All those uh, factors, uh, apart from uh, this, we also try to, you know, leverage uh, some of the functionalities which helps like uh, game changers and, you know, BPR and all those things has been covered in the EPRS document in, in detail. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question. Um, uh, how do you overcome the hurdles around sharing data internally between departments? And more importantly, concerns around data security and, pr and privacy for data that how to go beyond government boundaries or data that has to go beyond government boundaries. So you would 
there were various mentions, I think, probably from all of you about the, the importance of data and, and how there may be a reluctance to share data between departments. Um, how do you overcome those obstacles in practice? So, uh, as uh, Dr. Palla was mentioning about, you know, enterprise architecture is uh, uh, less about technology and more about, you know, handling the, uh, the political scenario. So, yeah, it's very, uh, very challenging uh, to interact with uh, various departmental stake stakeholders and extract uh, the information. Uh, yes, uh, we try to publicize uh, and then explain them about uh, the nature of this particular huge initiative and uh, the pros and cons of, you know, the or what are the pros of uh, this enterprise architecture definition having connected government in place has been explained to the stakeholders and then uh, uh, one asset uh, for this particular project, you know, not to exaggerate, uh, we are working with advisor CM. So whenever, whatever meeting we go, trust me, JSAT has sent to us. JETA, JSAT asked us to collect this data. So every department, they used to give this information to us. Trust me, these are the trick we are following it. So. We, we never faced, I mean, definitely there are the challenges, but uh, we convinced them, explained them, and uh, we showed them the roadmap. We showed them the importance of having a 2B architecture in place, what benefits uh, the department gets, gets out of it, what benefits uh, the government is going to get, what benefits citizen is going to get. So, and we are able to uh, extract uh, the information from various departments. That is how the service filtration has been done. So today, 1,030 has come to 645. If I may add to that, uh, in fact, uh, as Mr. Satyanarayana was mentioning during his session, over the period of April to June, uh, we are planning uh, workshop sessions for district officers. And one of the key things is for them to understand the value of data sharing and collaborative. So, that is part of the overall change management process. So that's one aspect of it. One, that is one aspect of it. And the second thing is about data security and privacy. I was talking to Bala from, you know, my friend Bala there from TCS. I was telling, how much of data do you share without any concern to Facebook and Twitter? It's all there, right? They are monetizing the data. So if you don't worry about that, why are you worrying too much? I mean, I'm sure the government will take care of this. So just one, adding a, a couple of, uh, uh, bits of information. One is on the, you know, the possessiveness about data that the government departments typically have, agencies have. How do we handle? Fortunately for us, you know, the technology is such today that we have the SOA, we have the web services. They don't have to part with their database in any manner physically. There is a service request that goes and comes back with only the specific bit of bits and bytes of information that is needed for rendering the service. So gone are the days where you have to take a replica of the whole database and keep parked it to another department. That, those, that situation is no longer there. So that is a a plus point for us uh, in terms of uh, technology which enables you are giving the information but you are not parting with the whole database as such. So that is uh, uh, one way, you know, departments are increasingly convinced that, you know, they are safe with their own uh, information. They are the owners and they are the, you know, data controllers, right? So that's, I just wanted to add the technological dimension to it. Yeah. On the privacy issue, also, while web services will also address that to some extent, but we have also brought in, uh, brought in a, a policy on security and privacy in the context of e-pragati, which is available on the web website of Andhra Pradesh government, you can see. And uh, as I mentioned in my earlier talk, uh, initial talk, that we have taken the best principles from the European Commission uh, principles on data privacy and built into our policy. And that is going to give the measure of confidence that is required both to the departments and more importantly
to the citizens whose data we are handling. Okay, thank you. Um, how does ePragadi enable price reduction of agricultural products such as rice and dal? Does it help in reducing middlemen in the supply chain from the farm to the retail store? Yeah, in fact, uh, is price reduction good or bad from the point of the farmer? So we have to balance it also, uh, ultimately. Uh, but all the same, you know, the disintermediation is also one of the outcomes that is expected in the primary sector. We have got one of the modules there, in, uh, which he, uh, is part of that big picture you have seen, uh, which deals with the e-markets or e-mandi, it is called our e-market. So it is directly addressing the issue of uh, disintermediation. How do you achieve the disintermediation uh, is addressed squarely in e-pragati. Yeah. 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 Just adding to that, uh, so we could also look at uh, using, again, the data analytics to predict and then give the best price to the farmers, right? So if, uh, let us say, there is a, going to be a shortfall in dal, then we can tell the farmers, okay, uh, this is going to be the scenario, this is what you need to do, so that he is prepared, right? So then, rather than saying the price reduction, you know, you could say the farmer, the benefits can reach the farmer, right? So you will have a farmer who knows what the price is going to be, and you would have seen, you would have heard about a lot of news of uh, farmers to say, happening because they really did not know, uh, you know, that, for example, the sugarcane farmers, right? So they did not know that they should not grow sugarcane this season. So nobody told them about that. So they went ahead, they grew sugarcane and then they found out that there was no demand, right? So we could prevent those situations, you know, we could give them good knowledge, insights and uh, analytics, right? Uh, so leveraging analytics. Okay, thank you. I love this question. Um, in Dr. Palab's presentation, knowledge and skill development was highlighted. Is anything being done to leverage TOGAF certified individuals in building more architects for the country? Uh, I think the open group should be taking that question, but <laughs> yes, I can tell you as a professional enterprise architect, there is a lot of, uh, you know, one of the benefits, one of the advantages of ePragati has been uh, the general awareness, the general knowledge about enterprise architecture has gone up, people have realized that this is an important, uh, uh, you know, profession, so to speak. And when you have a successful example like e Pragati, it lends credibility to the entire story. Otherwise, people are just thinking this is just 622 pages, as he was mentioning, or 700 odd pages of a book. But then how do you actually, you know, realize it in, in practice? Uh, so I am seeing a lot of demand coming in, uh, you know, f to me, for instance, saying that can we become a professional enterprise architect, even sp people speaking to me during the break, I says, where the person actually says, I have 12 years of this experience, that, that's my, you know, thing, can I become an architect? Uh, so, yes, there is a lot of, there's a lot of uh, uh, awareness being created just by having this uh, project as, as a showcase, you know, from, from, a, from a, you know, professional architect perspective. And I'm sure the open group is, would be very interested in increasing the number of people who are certified. In fact, if my statistic is right, at this point, if I'm not wrong, Bangalore has the highest number of TOGAF certifications, certified professionals in the world. It is number one in the world. India is number three. Number three in the world as a country, Bangalore is number one. So I'm saying, let Hyderabad be there. Yeah. Right? So that is, that is actually a challenge to all of you. And also, uh, further information on this is we are planning to establish a Ni Pragati Academy, which is one of the, uh, which is for capacity building in and around e-governance and around e-pragati. But one of the courses that it's, we envisage it to run is on enterprise architecture uh, uh, exclusively because going forward, it's more and more people are required in this domain, both within government and outside. So e-pragati Academy, we, uh, our Honorable Chief Minister suggested that it should come up in the new capital city of Amaravati, uh, you know. So we have requested for land uh, for this e-pragati complex. 
one of which will be e prakriti academy there yeah. good to hear thank you um <laughs> yes round of applause for that one um next question it's good that we have a kind of system that provides citizen related information clo uh, getting closer to real time um what about citizen data upgrades how easy is it for a citizen to upgrade his or her data and uh, with respect to security and authenticity how does the government handle that we have a uh, uh one of the system called uh, people hub uh, which uh, actually a repository of the citizen uh, almost uh, i can say 95% of andhra uh, citizen uh, information is available on a people hub earlier it is called uh, srdh state residential data hub so today uh, we named it as a people hub and uh, that is getting uh, no further enhanced uh, uh, by uh, collecting the socio economic uh, data of uh, every individual every citizen of andhra in terms of you know gathering uh, the further uh, information in terms of family and then you know uh, respect to uh, family tree and you know the residential information other credentials and which are getting added to uh, the citizen repository uh, coming to the security aspect of it you know uh, we uh, it, it is a uh, uh, highly uh, secured system trying to provide uh, the the standard uh, uh, the security features like you know the authentication authorization and then uh, the cyber security is the the major component uh, which we are trying to build as a part of uh, e prakati initiative um, so uh, those uh, things have been implemented uh, as a part of taking the uh, the uh, security aspects of uh, the uh, the citizen information and uh, and also some of the security standards has been adopted uh, uh, to implement uh, e pragati initiative just adding to that so if i understood the question it's also about how you're going to keep the data citizen data synchronized and up to date and secure security aspect of course uh, was addressed already but uh, it is important to keep the data synchronized and current and up to date in all the systems because now you have so many departments maintaining Uh, their own you know databases and you cannot get rid of them you know in one shot right so uh, that's also uh, we have we have a solution for that we, are, we have a solution to ensure that wherever people data get updated whichever system it is it is propagated to the other systems uh, you know in a near real time basis of course but you also have to understand that there will be some workflow some approvals etc so considering that it will not be a uh, near real time always but where possible it could be near real time but uh, if it requires uh, approvals etc then that workflow will be defined so at least uh, with the latency of let us say 24 or 48 hours you should have the data synchronized across most of the systems great thank you um we don't have time for too many more questions but um here's one how do you see e e pragati transforming to a state where we could monetize the data and make the initiative self funding in the long run what is your overall view on data monetization using e pragati yeah i think uh, it's a very interesting point how do you it's not about monetizing the data which takes us on a wrong connotation or a purely commercial connotation which as a government we do not want to do that at all uh in a commercial sense you uh, you know you understand what i mean the a commercial concern how it monetizes such huge data which is not at all the intention in fact it is expressly prohibited as an activity by the government on the other hand how do you make the pro e pragati program self sustainable to a large extent is through levying some user charges wherever 
some value addition is uh, provided to the value added services are provided to the citizen or to any department you know a charge back mechanism uh, so that you know the at least o and m costs are recovered if not the capital uh, costs so that is the philosophy with which we are going and if you see overall to out of 2000 crores uh, about uh, 1100 crores will be the capex and rest is uh, the uh, recovered through a, a charge back mechanism or user charge uh, you know mechanism so that is how we will see but not uh, we can't exactly compare it with monetizing the data uh, which is a different uh, aspect altogether yes please do. yeah in fact this this uh, kind of leads me to a larger uh, issue where many countries are grappling with as in if all of this data is available can you make it available as in open data right and many countries have tried doing that and monetization is one of the one of the issues that deal they de- they have to deal with because in singapore for instance i have seen where where the government is making available all of the data in analyzable format now i as a sme i can take that data and provide a new service for instance if i want to know what is what are, where are the uh, let's say location of the public toilets in the in a radius of 1 km right from here right i mean i could provide that service as an app now so the issue that will come is if i as a private provider am providing that service and making money out of it do i have to pay back to the government because the source data is coming from the government so it gets into a lot of issues because there are legal implications and all of this so uh, i would say we have not gone to that level of discussion yet uh, open data is one of the topics that is a you know big topic for digital india uh, but eventually we will have to grapple with that and monetization will be one of the factors as he said while that is not the intent uh, i think the use of government data to provide by private providers to provide new services co create new services is definitely one of the things that the state wants to do because it contributes to this whole uh, digital ecosystem because see this is not about building 72 applications and releasing them it's also about uh, encouraging uh, small and medium enterprises to be part of the ecosystem and they can actually build applications and uh, things yeah, like that yeah absolutely so you must understand that this is much bigger than just doing an architecture there's a lot of ecosystem thing going around here and the vision is definitely very grand and this is how digital government should work we have actually a component called app store in that big picture that i had shown uh which is uh, where we are exposing uh the apis and the data that is shareable to the public to the developer community to the startup community so so that they can come up with apps which are more uh useful to the citizens and then they can in turn monetize that there is no problem uh in that so government by itself would not like to monetize but indirectly will expose the apis wherever the the, the situation to uh, you know permits that and the data make it as open data so that the developers can really develop apps and host it on our app store platform uh and then derive benefit out of that thank you time for two more questions i think this one is a sort of multi part one but you've all mentioned in some way the e e highway as a service bus that connects different different layers how is it realized how much of it will eventually be automated and do you envision envision it at an uh state level or at a national level ultimately yeah so again uh, e highway is one of the uh, core component uh, which actually acts like an integration channel uh, to connect uh, the various uh, departmental applications uh, not only the departmental applications uh, but also it, it should also uh, uh, helps us to connect to the third party systems like you know banks insurance uh, companies and other things Uh, using uh, various gateway technologies so uh, definitely yes uh, you should be able to uh, you should be able to connect uh, uh, as long as the integration channel is in place you know which helps you in mediation routing transformation and you know fill station and a workflow centric approach 
uh, not just a state level, but uh, you should also able to connect to the central government departments and also uh, based on the requirement, uh, you can connect to any, any third party system uh, based on the, the, the within the security uh, scope implementation. However, uh, this e-highway is in addition to an integration channel, it, it also acts like a uh, registry and repository for uh, the software service components which you built. So it should be able to have a registry of services such that uh, when you implement this uh, huge e pragati system, the SIs uh, need to look at the registry and the repository and uh, uh, try to reuse those uh, software uh, components which have been built. And the repository will be continuously uh, imp incrementing based on the implementation of each block, what uh, we have shown you earlier. And uh, it eliminates the uh, redundancy of uh, the service development, uh, development and you know, uh, reusable components uh, uh, and uh, shareable components will be available. And uh, we can also bring in uh, the chargeback uh, model uh, at, across the departments who are consuming these services. So that can be done. So, uh, so just to come, come back to the, the question, so it is uh, basically predominantly an integration channel which helps you to connect to the departments, uh, government departments, state, central or any third party systems. That makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Last question before we let you all go for lunch then. It's a bit of a mean one. Do you think ePragadi is doable in two years? Yeah. Yes, yes and yes. <laughs> we, we wouldn't know if we don't try, right? I mean, trying doesn't guarantee success, but not trying guarantees failure. So you have to work with that, right? Yeah. So it is uh, driven by at the highest level and uh, there are actually, as I mentioned, a number of challenges to overcome. Uh, uh, you know, procurement itself is a big uh, ba barrier to implementation rather. While well, it's a facilitation, but it takes time. As a, that way, time barrier is there. But still, uh, we are already six months into the implementation. Six, our Chief Minister has given the deadline also, 16 September 2017 should be, should be completed. <laughs> so, we are working against that tight uh, time schedule. As you, and I, I think uh, uh, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work anywhere el else in India, definitely, if not in the world. Yeah. It, it needs to work, doesn't it? That's what I've heard. Yeah, it needs to work. So, uh, j just to add a point here, you know, uh, we already started uh, floating uh, RFPs in the market. So almost a uh, uh, couple of them are I mean, one already floated and uh, the response is also coming and uh, the three or four are in line. So, the essays are also lined up for it. So, it is definitely achievable. It can be done. We should have done that. Great. Thank you. Well, apologies to those, qu those of you who asked questions I didn't get to. I think I got to at least one of each of your questions. At least I tried to. But... Um, in order to make sure that you had, oh, James has a ton more, but in order to make sure that we do have some time to, to eat lunch today, we'll, we'll call it a day there. But uh, a big thank you to our speakers and our panelists this morning and to you for your attention. And uh, we'll be back here for the tracks this afternoon. But a uh, big thank you to the panel. May, may I just add one sentence? I think really I must admire the participations of all the participants. I have not participated in any conference where no member of the audience has uh, opened uh, his or her mouth. <laughs> so, it's really, they have written it down and it's really a different uh, feeling altogether. Yeah. Thanks. I think it, all the same, it has been participative. Thanks.